Unsupervised Thinking, a podcast on neuroscience, artificial intelligence, and science more broadly. We are a group of neuroscientists. I'm Grace. I'm Josh. I'm Adam. And the topic for this episode is uh, the neuroscientific zoo, I'll call it. Uh, the menagerie of model organisms. Uh, we're going to be talking about the use of animals in neuroscience research and what prompts the use of different animals and the benefits and not benefits of using different animals. And in particular, we're going to uh, be focusing on kind of small, simple organisms and the potential that they have for telling us about other brains or just the value that they have in general. And so Adam is back with us. Adam was previously on our episode about how to study behavior. Adam, would you like to introduce yourself again? Sure. Uh, I'm Adam Calhoun. I am a postdoc at Princeton University where I work with Mala Murthy. Uh, we work on fruit fly courtship and trying to understand the neural basis of behavior uh, and how animals take in sensory input and decide what kind of behavior they want to want to produce. Um, so we do that from just a behavioral quantification, very carefully measuring what the animals are doing, and then also uh, going in and doing uh, molecular manipulations and calcium imaging and kind of the whole gamut of, uh, of what neuroscience can do with small model organisms. Maybe, and just sort of like to keep it super clear, we can maybe, Adam, you can elaborate that like fruit flies are invertebrates and compare this and what, what you know, kind of how do you think about that at some very high level? Yeah. Uh, what do you mean by some very high level? Well, just, just I mean, I, I guess many people who study neuroscience might have a sort of vertebrate-centric yes. view or something like this. Yes. So uh, uh, fruit flies are invertebrates. Uh, they're a, a, I don't want to say a step up because because neuroscientists get kind of touchy about this. Uh, <laughs> but for my gra graduate school work, I worked with C. elegans. Um, which we will also be discussing. Which we'll also so. be discussing. They're another invertebrate which only has 302 neurons in the nervous system. Uh, Drosophila has on the order of 100,000 neurons, so it's many orders of magnitude, uh, or it's a few orders of magnitude more neurons. But they're both kind of in this pack of animals that are known as invertebrates, which uh, obviously don't have a vertebra, but also have a slightly different uh, organizational structure of its nervous system. And so um, one of the kind of questions in neuroscience, or one of the the kind of back, back and forths that we get in neuroscience is... Uh, uh, how relevant are uh, invertebrate animals to people who study vertebrates, such as mice or rats or monkeys or humans? And why would you study them versus studying things that, that mammals can do, such as kind of higher order co cognitive processes? And I, I guess I have, also before proceeding, I guess I have some coarse intuition that uh, invertebrates are probably more heterogeneous than vertebrates. Like, I mean, like mean sea snails and sea elegans and insects kind of all fit into this invertebrate category and they seem kind of yeah. fairly diverse compared to vertebrates, which are all kind of, I guess, evolutionarily through some bottleneck of... Yeah, of, I mean, I don't know the exact dates, but my guess is the time from now to when uh, uh, vertebrates branched off is long is shorter than the time from when vertebrates branched off to when invertebrates originated. So they've been around lo longer, so they have more time to speciate. Yeah, okay, that, make, that makes sense, I think. All right, that's a good first past introduction. I want to talk about what we read for this. So I should say that the inspiration for this episode was um, a listener's suggestion. I believe that listener's name was Kyle Laporta. Um, but he made that suggestion about three years ago. <laughs> so <laughs> anyone who's listening who's made a suggestion, that's the kind of time scale we're working on, it seems. <laughs> um, but no, actually, the reason for the delay was that I never knew what we should read for this um, because it's kind of a broad and diffuse topic. So I ended up just settling on some stuff. Uh, and there were more pieces that I looked at when trying to find stuff to read. So I'll, I'll link to kind of everything that I looked through. But the stuff we ended up reading was um, The Emperor's New Wardrobe, Rebalancing Diversity of Animal Models in Neuroscience Research. And that was by Michael Yartsev. Uh, it was a 2017 science article. And then so that's kind of a broad overview of the topic. And then we read things that were a little bit more specific about what different organisms um, have offered, especially different simple organisms. So we read an article that was 
Uh, it was an EMBO news article, which was covering a symposium that happened, and that was called Model Organisms, New Kids on the Block, uh, by Tillman Kessling. And uh, then we also read The Fruits of Fly Research, which, which was an editorial piece in Nature Neuroscience in 2000, and C. Elegans, A Model System for Systems Neuroscience, which is a current opinion in neurobiology piece from 2009, written by Sengupta and Samuel. So we got kind of a diverse range of thoughts about what simple organisms have offered and uh, kind of the concept of model organisms and how they should be chosen in general. So hopefully we'll just kind of talk about this area broadly because it is kind of a broad uh, thing to discuss. And I want to say that, you know, when you sent me these papers, I went through and I tried to look for, you know, I thought I, I didn't think that many of these made the, a very strong case for model organisms uh, or as strong of a case as I would have liked. I think Michael Yartsev's did the first one, but the other ones I was kind of more more wishy washy on. Partly because some of them are like twenty years old, which is I mean, oh wow, two thousand is twenty. I know, years right? Ago. This Jesus. is before I was graduated from high school, right? So a long time ago, and things have advanced so much since then. Uh, I think it's kind of missing out on some of the concepts that we think about these days. Um, but I, I wasn't able to find any good or or reviews that really satisfied me on this. Partly, I kind of reached out, I know you saw this, Grace, since I asked you about uh, having a Twitter poll or a Twitter uh, uh, feedback. Uh, you do what I do whenever I don't know the answer <laughs> right. to something, I crowdsource it on Twitter. Exactly. <laughs> but it's just kind of the point that I don't know that there's there's a great like review out there that, that we're missing. Yeah, and I, so there's one element, like a review of just what has been learned from different organisms. And then uh, the thing that I was looking for as well is kind of, I don't know, the philosophy of model organisms mm -hmm. and choosing that. And the Yarts of Peace did a little bit of both, but you would expect that there'd just be some more out there. There were some pieces that were about biology more broadly, but I wanted neuroscience specific because I think it mm -hmm. has its own set of concerns. Um, so yeah, there really isn't a lot of readily available writing on this topic. Yeah, uh, it's kind of surprising. Uh, I don't know how. Sorry, uh, I don't know how you want to introduce this topic or introduce the first paper because uh, I think one of the things that at least I was thinking about as I was reading these is um, what's the what's the point of neuroscience. Uh, oh my god, I couldn't stop thinking about that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know when I talk to people, you know, I work on invertebrates, and I work on invertebrates because uh, the type of knowledge that I'm interested in in neuroscience is very much uh, a kind of mechanistic view of, you know, what does this neuron say to that neuron say to that neuron, how does that specifically produce behavior, produce some function, um, and I'm less interested in, you know, I kind of say this as a joke, that I don't really care about people. Uh, but it's kind of true. Like I'm not interested in understanding the nervous system because I'm interested in how humans work. I'm just interested in how animals work. Uh, but I don't think that's prevalent in much of neuroscience or that common. I think most people don't kind of think of it that way. They're more interested in how uh, how their nervous system produces behavior and produces kind of the like more complicated cognitive things um, that we do. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think you, I think you do get both perspectives, but I, I kind of agree with you that probably most people who identify as neuroscientists are are inclined to understand humans, and I, I also think the funding ecosystem mm -hmm. uh, is probably is probably uh, geared that way, right? I mean, yeah, th there's there's only so much amount of s sort of societal scale resources available for sort of questions of curiosity, and there are there's far more resources related to understanding humans and especially in the context of medicine. So I yeah. mean, I think that that definitely no, plays into which it. Which is totally fine. It's just I think the two kind of have different reasons for send, setting different model organisms, right? They may not, why would you say model organisms or what do they tell you may uh, be very different things if you're take, coming from the perspective of what do humans do versus what do animals do? Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. I do wonder, though, what the split is, because I think, yes, the funding environment and all that kind of makes it so that you have to at least say that you care about humans. Mm -hmm. But I think, especially kind of when you get to the more molecular level and people really just trying to figure out these, like, small circuits, I think there are a lot of people who are just like, no, I just want to know this bit. Like, this is what I want to know. I'm studying exactly what I want to know. Um, so I don't know. I It probably is tilted more towards people who... Uh, 
who are interested in understanding humans, but maybe not as much as it seems, mm -hmm. just because people are forced to say that. And I was, so I was going to kind of start this off by asking what we all thought the definition of a model organism was, because I'll say that I thought that model organism meant stand in for human, an organism that is a model we can use because we can't study humans directly. And apparently that's not what a model organism <laughs> is. <laughs> but that shows that I also, I'm also i one of the people who cares primarily about humans, and I want to understand the nervous system, mainly so that I can understand the nervous system of humans. Uh, I mean, I think that a model organism is just any any animal. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the, the different animals are hopefully models for different things. So frog might be a good good example of a model of synaptic transmission, because that's where a lot of a lot of knowledge of synaptic transmission came from, but there's no reason that, you know, you can't learn that from rodents, for instance. Yeah, so what this um, first article talks about, it uses model organism to mean an organism that's a good kind of place to study a particular process. Um, and that's what some other um, articles I was looking at were describing them as. So you have something that's a model organism for a particular thing like synaptic plasticity or audition or just something that you're interested in, you find the best thing, the best organism to study that thing in. And that was like kind of a confusing thought to me. One, because before you've studied the organisms, how do you know which is the best to study a certain thing in? Um, they give the example, which is like a classic example, that uh, Hodgkin and Huxley, the scientists who figured out how action potentials work, like how spikes happen, they studied that in a squid that has a giant axon in it. And the fact that that axon is very large is what made it feasible to do the detailed experiments that they were trying to do. It was like physically easier to do it on these, this large axon than it would be in any other animal that you picked randomly. But I don't even know how they knew that that squid had a big axon or how that was found in the first place. So the idea of like, okay, I want to understand olfaction. What is the mm -hmm. best animal to understand olfaction in? Like, how do you even go about answering I mean, that? I, like, to, to, to make your point, I think, in a slightly fairer way, it's, it's not that, like, I mean, of course, if there's some base of knowledge, you can look at the yeah, literature, yeah. Mm -hmm. right, and decide what it is. But the, I, I guess uh, there's some foundation of knowledge that's required to make informed decisions about how to subsequently study additional specific details. So, like, in the case of the squid giant axon, they presumably, I mean, I, I don't know if, I mean, this is an interesting tidbit. Like, did they figure that out themselves by searching through a bunch of animals for one with a large and accessible axon? Or was that somehow documented and observed by previous biologists? But I mean, I, th I think it is, we can, we can take it for granted that when there is a large enough body of available research in the primary literature, you can find, you know, you could, you could say, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something with a big axon. And you could read enough papers to find that. So, I mean, it, mm -hmm. of course, the, the scientific literature is available. But uh, I guess there needs to be this sort of sufficiently rich foundation of knowledge available that requires kind of more exploratory science um, to even just characterize that. Yeah. For instance, you might be interested in, in how animals communicate vocally. And then birds would be kind of a natural example. Um, but one of the... One of the uh, examples that came up on Twitter is um, uh, the discovery of uh, electric junctions between neurons, um, which I hadn't realized came from a uh, defense reflex uh, that has to be very fast. Uh, I forget if it was crayfish or, or horseshoe crabs, one of the two. Um, uh, they do this reflex where you tap them and they turn around really quick and try to run away. And up to that point, uh, the... All, all neurons were thought to communicate kind of chemically. Um, but when they were setting this, they found that they were actually electrically coupled. Um, and so now this is a good model organism for electrical production or, or electrical connection. Uh, but you wouldn't have known that unless you were kind of setting this random other behavior, this kind of exploratory. Yeah, so it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't that it was initially being studied for electrical junctions it was being studied right. for its reflex and then that was found and then now that's known so if you want to study that you can go to that i guess that's so this is kind of it brings up two things because you to say that this is a good model organism for a thing you can either mean it's good for that behavior like uh hawks have really good eyesight Mm -hmm. um, or you can mean that it's physically convenient, like more with the axon thing, or with the location of the brain and the body and how it's laid out, it might be 
more or less easy to have access to the brain of certain animals or whatever part of the brain that's relevant. for C. elegans or larval zebrafish, which are transparent. Yeah. Yeah. So we study things in C. elegans. I mean, I think C. elegans had other motivations. It seems like larval zebrafish are somewhat new in neuroscience, and it really is because when these fish are babies, they are see-through, and you can make neurons light up and record from all of their neurons at once because they happen to be see-through. Yeah. And so it's really not that everyone is so interested in how larval zebrafish work, but they're the animal you can see neurons in. And importantly, they're vertebrates. So for a, a vertebrate to be transparent is, is pretty rare. That's funny. Because they're transparent, I don't think of them as vertebrates. I know, right? <laughs> yeah. And because they're this molecular model organism that has this very fast generation time, they feel like a, an invertebrate, but they are a vertebrate. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, so yeah, they, this is why this concept of a model organism is kind of confusing to me. One, because I don't know what it means to be like, I want to understand olfaction broadly, so I'm going to find the animal that has the best smell and understand it there. That to me isn't that doesn't mean that you're going to understand it broadly. Maybe if you study the most specialized animal for something, you're studying like the weirdest version of it. Like that animal was way too over-optimized for that thing Mm -hmm. at the cost of other things. So you're studying a very particular form of that process that you're interested in. So that's why it doesn't necessarily make sense to me that you go out and find the best possible animal for the task in that they're the ones that do it the best but again this is i think showing my bias that i think we want to understand humans and like humans aren't that big on all faction so i mean a related point though just to sort of make make this in a way that might be slightly stronger right i mean it, it could also be that the extreme cases that seem experimentally accessible are somehow like anomal- anomalously idiosyncratic like, mm-hmm. for example, if you said, I want to study plumage on birds, normal birds, and then you study a peacock, right? That would be like a weird choice. Similarly, if, uh, if you find some obscure animal that's like ideal for studying some very specific thing that sounds generic, like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, this came up in the, in the case of barn owls at one point being used to study time delays between the, the two ears, so interoral time delays. And they, it turned out that the way that they did it was idiosyncratic relative to other animals. And maybe other animals do it in a way that's more shared across animals. But, but these animals, which are specialists for this, use like you know specialized neural infrastructure that is, is not representative of the way that it's uh, more widely done. Yeah, so, I, I had never heard that before, actually. I mean, I knew the barn owl story, but I didn't realize it was anomalous. Yeah, I just kind of still thought that that was the answer. Yeah, me too. Which is the risk of, yeah studying things in only one species. Yeah. But yeah, the, the finding was that rodents have a different way of, of doing this process of localizing sound than owls do. Yeah. And owls were the model organism. But but I don't know now if owls are the common one or rodents. Yeah, I mean, they maybe it's birds Mongolian versus... Gerbils. I don't know if Mongolian gerbils are just weird or what. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be birds versus mammals. It could be more specific than that where different yeah. individual species do it differently. So uh, yeah, I mean... Clearly, that's, I mean, you could view this as a case of picking your idiosyncratic animal is a poorly advised strategy, or you could view this as a case of you need to do it in multiple animals to see if there are commonalities across this. Yeah, if you're going to claim that you're interested in hearing, like, I, like, that's your broad interest, then, yeah, you should probably be looking across species. I just wonder, is that anyone's broad interest? I feel like people are interested in specific, like, a lot of times when people say they're interested in hearing, they're interested in how humans hear. And it, again, it goes back to just not being clear about what the purpose of the research yeah, I mean, is. And, and to elaborate on this, I think in, in the sort of lay public discourse around certain neuroscience or certainly other kinds of psychology or especially evolutionary, evolutionary psychology kinds of findings, people will generalize too liberally from specific examples. So if there is only one uh, example of an animal that has been studied thoroughly for some process, People will just pretend a lied over the sort of uh, generalization, like, oh, animals do it this way, so humans do it this way. I mean, people in, you know, I don't know, the popular press are, are doing this because they want their argument to sound more rigorous or whatever uh, than it would be if they just said, we don't know how humans do this or why humans do this, and I'm speculating. But I, I, I guess Im- implicit in the way a lot of findings about animals are used like persuasively or as evidence for making arguments or things like this it definitely is the case that people are 
uh, generalizing often from animals to humans. So I, I think there are people who are interested in studying the idiosyncrasies of animals, but often that research in terms of its impact, kind of almost wrongly, or it's, it's misused or misdirected impact, is, is at generalizing with often too little evidence towards how it relates to human, uh, let's say, neural function. Yeah, and like, so in the um, EMBO News article, they're explicitly talking about looking at the same thing across different species to understand evolution. And so that seems like a good um, use of looking across species in a, a situation where you definitely have to look across species, and also a situation where you definitely have to look at simpler organisms if you want to see how um, how nervous systems emerge out of animals or organisms that don't have nervous systems. So I thought that that was like a pretty convincing use case of simple organisms and of model organisms in a way that's not meant to understand humans directly. Like it's clear what the goal is. They're trying to understand evolution. Um, and just some of the kind of details from that, they were talking about um, people who study sponges to see how uh, cells that weren't neurons, kind of the precursor components, like how uh, synaptic transmission, when neurotransmitters are released at the synapse, that's like exocytosis, which uh, happens uh, in cells normally. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then they also talk about uh, like kind of going beyond the normal species that are used. So we were talking about fruit fly, but there's a very particular type of fruit fly that's mm -hmm. used in most neuroscience research. And they were looking at a very related uh, species of fruit fly, but one that's particular to the Seychelles and uh, has developed different olfactory receptors so that it becomes sensitive to the type of fruit that's prevalent there. Uh, so seeing how that could happen, they said it was just a single amino acid switch that uh, led to the olfactory receptors being different. So uh, that's kind of another twist. We're kind of talking about, you know, flies versus mice versus uh, fish or whatever. But even like within fruit flies, there's a whole bunch of diversity that gets overlooked normally in neuroscience research. Yeah. So one of the, I think because of CRISPR, and I think CRISPR is one of the things that doesn't get brought up in any of these articles, I don't think, uh, because it's too new. Uh, but CRISPR is, I think, really leading the way in... Uh, expanding the number of, of model organisms that people are using because it makes uh, providing genetic access and molecular access so easy in a way that you couldn't do before. Um, and this is even coming up in animals that could have had easy genetic access, such as other Drosophila species. So fruit flies or Drosophila, uh, we colloquially call them, call them fruit flies. Uh, but in the lab, we use Drosophila melanogaster, but there's also Drosophila simulans or Drosophila seychellia and Drosophila virilis and et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have the genetic tools in Drosophila melanogaster because that's what we've been using for so long. But there's no reason we couldn't be using any of the others. And by using the other ones, we're able to look at, uh, uh, at behaviors that they're able to do in similar but slightly different ways and, and see how evolution evolved the same small little circuits that are in both organisms, uh, but but change you know some set of synapses to make them behave slightly differently. Just just for access, can you uh, sort of briefly overview CRISPR? Just at a very very yeah, high level. just uh, at a very high level, CRISPR is a uh, uh, genetic or molecular tool that lets us introduce uh, mutations or new or new genetic material, I guess. Uh, to kind of express express DNA that we're interested in. So um, it, there's been this long uh, series of this long series of work uh, in in mice and and Drosophila and C. elegans and these model organisms to uh, put in genes that allow us to manipulate the nervous system. Uh, and it's taken you know decades to do that. And now with CRISPR, it's a tool that lets us uh, do that and make genetic modifications uh, very easily in, in kind of any arbitrary uh, animal. Yeah, so like a big reason why mice are so prevalent. I mean, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, like a chicken and egg thing. Like mm -hmm. there was work done to provide genetic tools on mice, like specialized tools that can make you produce a mouse that has a certain genetic change that you want it to have. Um, and people develop those tools and then so people were using mice more and then more tools get developed specifically for mice and now it kind of becomes impossible to do a lot of the fancy new research techniques in anything but mice because they were so specifically developed for them but if you can open up those genetic tools to any species 
then we could plausibly kind of go back to the situation where uh, you pick the organism that's quote unquote best for your question and all of the same tools are available uh, in that organism as they would be in in mice or in Drosophila where they were developed specifically for that. Because it is kind of the point of uh, Michael Yartsev's article. He's saying that historically people would choose the animal and it's become increasingly less diverse, the, the pool from which people draw from. I think the statistic was in like 2007... 75% of research organisms in neuroscience were uh, rat, mouse, or human. Uh, so he's claiming that the diversity is really far down. I feel like kind of like human should be its own category. Um, because, I mean, in some ways it's easier to use humans if you're talking about like a psychology experiment where they just like come into the lab for an hour or something. Mm -hmm. It just feels different. Um, but yeah, so his point like throughout that article is that we used to use more diverse species and the diversity has shrunk and that's a problem for neuroscience. Yeah, um, and and I think that's because, as you pointed out, all these genetic tools that are available in mice and uh, and fruit flies and, and C. elegans that aren't available in other animals. And it's one of the reasons that mice are becoming, have been becoming more popular than, than rats, which you know, are, you know, I think people like to think of as similar if you don't work closely with them. But rats are actually uh, much smarter uh, and can do kind of more complex cognitive tasks. Um, but they don't have the same genetic tools and, and the same kind of ease of manipulation of the nervous system as mice. So mice are becoming more popular because of that, not because of their, their use for a particular uh, uh, behavior. Yeah, it drives me crazy because, I mean, I don't understand all the genetics, but I assume that if the same efforts went into developing the genetic tools for rats, then rats would be the popular thing. And I think I think there's differences in uh, how well, I don't think it's well understood, but I think there's differences in how well different um, uh, organisms pick up DNA and how well oh. they can fight off this transgenic DNA. Um, so C. elegans, for instance, is really nice because you can literally just inject DNA into the gonad and it'll just kind of absorb it into its egg and that's all you need to do. It has like n no defenses as far as I can tell. Um, whereas a lot of the tools that we have for mice, you try to put them in, in rodent, in rats, uh, they may not work as well. Okay. It's very upsetting though because rats are smarter and mice are meaner. So yeah. really just all around. But also, I mean, we should talk about... Um, it's not just the genetic tools, so that's a big part of it. It's also kind of the whole infrastructure around housing and breeding animals that comes into play here as well. Again, because mice are so popular, I mean, there are whole companies that uh, breed specific mice for different lab purposes and provide uh, the housing bins and containers and just all of the stuff that you need to run a lab that houses a particular organism, uh, that's all kind of mass produced for the organisms that are commonly used. And if you want to go out there and be like, okay, well, I want to study this new organism that no one's really studied in the lab before because I think it's a really good example of the problem I'm interested in, well, who's going to make the... Uh, equipment that you use to perform surgery on that animal and what where are you going to look up like a brain atlas of that animal and how are you going to know what kind of anesthesia you like will work on it and the dosage and just mm -hmm. all these things that you can just look up for mice really easily would need to be established anytime you're going to bring in a new model organism mm -hmm. yeah and i think even you know we're talking about mice and and rats but obviously there's all sorts of other rodents right so there's shrews which have this really you know they have their own kind of interesting behaviors where uh the the children will follow along behind the the mother uh hopi hoekstra works on uh deer mice uh which have this burrowing behavior so they make their own little houses and if you're even though the the brains are probably pretty similar uh if you were going to uh really understand how say the visual system of one works you'd have to do a lot of very basic research all over again to to really make sure it's done the same way in that animal right yeah, yeah, all of the basic research needs to be reestablished before you can ask any more complicated questions. Like, um, there was a paper a few years ago that showed that at least one particular type of turtle that they studied doesn't have retinotopy. So mm -hmm. in their visual cortex, the neurons aren't physically laid out according to like the part of visual space they represent. And I feel like retinotopy is something we usually just kind of assume, uh, <laughs> in most animals so it's like oh they don't even have retinotopy like <laughs> you're starting from zero if you want to use a new organism yeah 
Yeah, but on the other hand, uh, there, yeah, there's just some things you can't do. Uh, uh, so I think that's why it's exciting that this CRISPR technology is letting us kind of introduce the same genetic tools that make, say, characterizing retinotopy maybe easier than they would if you didn't have those genetic tools. Yeah. So another another point that's kind of, uh, I think, very relevant in the Artsef, uh paper uh, review is that essentially this requires a very enterprising person, right? In order to pick a new model organism requires probably a young professor reasonably well-resourced and kind of committed there are to... no young well-resourced professors. yeah no i mean that, that's kind of i mean he says this he says as much right i mean uh, it's got to be like a young professor reasonably well-resourced who's kind of committed to a research enterprise for a long enough period of time that they can get through all of this uh you know kind of build up effort uh to, to get to the point where they can actually ask the questions that interest them which is what um, michael so, did uh, with bats right so michael yartsev uh, who wrote this paper uh, studies bat grid cells. Um, and so grid cells are the, the cells that kind of tell you in some sense where you are, or how, how the environment relates. Uh, so place cells tell you where you are, grid cells kind of repeatedly uh, have this kind of periodic mapping in space. And bats fly in 3D, so that's very different, and they have to have 3D grid cells to tell them where they are in 3D space. Uh, and so this is what Michael Yartsev studies. Um, he did this with a PhD, he did this as his P, as a PhD student with yes. uh, a professor. What is it, Ulamowski? Yes. But so he was working on an animal that hadn't previously been studied in this way before. Yeah. And that is an interesting example. So the grid cells were found in rodents first, right? Mm -hmm. Not crazy. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah, that Nobel Prize. Um, and so then, this is kind of a another thing that he talks about it like then it motivates you and maybe makes it worthwhile to put in the effort to pioneer a new organism. The finding in one organism says, oh, well, it would be really interesting to see if this happens the same way or a different way in this other organism, in the case of bats, it being 3D rather than 2D. Um, and the, another example he talks about in the piece is uh, adult neurogenesis, new neurons being born in the fully developed brain, which was something people didn't think happened. And I didn't realize he says that that was first discovered in Songbird. No, it was discovered somewhere else, but then the corroboration in songbirds made people believe that it was perhaps a more widespread phenomenon. Okay, and then after that, people really started looking hard in other species. So you get this kind of spread, which is why maybe it makes sense that you want to find the animal that it's easiest to study in, so you're not working so hard to find something that may or may not be true, and then once it's established in that animal, then you go on to study it in an animal that maybe it's harder to find in, but you have more confidence that you're likely to find it. Yes. And I guess that's another benefit of having these smaller and simpler animals. They have uh, faster lifespans and generations, and you can produce more of them. So like in the the paper that was talking about fruit fly research, they were this was when the genome of the fruit fly had just been uh, established, and they were... Uh, talking about like the, the potential that that brought, because at that time it was only fruit fly and C. elegans that had the genome. Um, and But then you can do, when people do do, these kind of big genetic scans in fruit flies, right, where you just kind of like knock mm -hmm. out a bunch of genes and just see if you can observe any differences uh, based on what gene was knocked out. And that's something that you can't really do at any scale in mice or anything like that. Right, and... and um... You know, this was a big deal in fruit flies and in, in Drosophila because if you're going to introduce a, a, a transgene, it really helps to know uh, what the genome has and, and where is a good place to place that gene. Maybe this is a bit tangential, but uh, another example is uh, C. elegans, where it's quite small and they uh, did the connectome first there, right? The connectome being the full set yes. of connections between all the neurons, which we talk about in our episode on the connectome. Uh, uh, where they, yeah, so just for people who didn't listen to that, they sliced it up and, and were able to scan uh, slice by slice in the, um, in the C. elegans and then map how each neuron is connected to each every other neuron. Um, and then now this has been, uh, uh, people are trying to do this now in fruit flies. Um, so at Genalia Research Institute, uh, they have, I think, two competing uh, research programs to uh, slice up the fruit fly brand and find the connection between every single set of neurons. 
Um, and this allows them, or allows everyone, uh, to now uh, use that information in, in kind of a new way and to uh, uh, find connections that we wouldn't have been able to find otherwise. Yeah, and I mean, the reason that you have to do this in small organisms is because it's an insane amount of work um, and just computationally it's difficult because you have to slice the brain into a bazillion tiny, tiny slices and then go back and trace each individual neuron through all those slices to see what it connects to. So it just, it, it couldn't, it still kind of can't be done in anything larger than a fruit fly, even almost conceptually, uh, so it had to be done first there. And then the interesting bit is kind of having it, the, I don't know, debate that followed about the usefulness of it. Apparently, the consensus is that it's useful enough to, to go after it in the fruit fly, but there was a bit of a like, oh, well, we got the connectome in the C. elegans, and we still don't completely understand how C. elegans work, so like, was it worthwhile to go through that effort? And so you kind of need the test case of the small animal where you can get something like the connectome and where you have like a plausible sense that you could understand the organism in some form or another uh, as the test bed for these ideas that you'd want to apply in a larger animal in a way that would be more costly and more uncertain. Right. Um, and I think now that they've also not just shown the usefulness, but shown how to do it. Uh, well, the fact that they showed how to do it back in the 60s, 70s with uh, C. elegans has really helped show that you can do it in fruit flies. And there's a lot of uh, uh, push to do, you know, not the whole brain, but large chunks of the brain of zebrafish and of uh, even mice, maybe not large chunks of, of the mouse, but, you know, relatively large chunks of the mouse. Um, because we now have the technology to do it uh, better and faster, and especially uh, there's been a lot of work on the kind of AI and neural network technology to do the uh, connection. Uh, so one of the hard parts, one of the most kind of uh, labor-intensive parts is uh, taking these scans, these very small, very thin scans of uh, the uh, of the brain, and saying, okay, this bit over here is connected to this bit in the next scan. Uh, and if you like, if you go through many different kind of sheets of the scan, uh, eventually getting like this is one long neuron. Uh, that's very labor-intensive and very difficult. Uh, but there's been huge advances in the kind of neuroscience or the the uh, neural network side of things. Uh, that allows for very automated reconstructions, uh, as well as technology in the um, the scanning electron microscopes allow these things to be done much more easily. Um, and so now that you have that, you can go into bigger organisms and say, okay, now we can try to do this in the zebrafish or the mouse. Um, I kind of want to talk about as well the extent to which neuroscience has inherited its model organisms, because in the fruit fly paper, they talk about how... Uh, the fruit fly has contributed more to the study of development, to like the study of a developing embryo than any other organism. And in the first paper, they talk about how mice were used uh, in part because they were useful for developmental biology because of their relatively fast uh, generations. And so it seems like there's a bit of like neuroscience has taken what other uh, fields of biology have chosen and developed, and we've kind of retroactively figured out what we can do with them and study them. So the, uh, the, the statement would be, biology is big, it has lots of researchers, and there's many questions, and there are a few organisms that perhaps for historical reasons, even within biology, have been useful. And neuroscience is this relatively small subset of biology, and so at the industrial scale, it's easier to just borrow these model organisms, and that's why we have mouse, you're saying. Yeah, maybe even fruit fly and C. elegans, I think. I mean, a lot of these were established originally outside of neuroscience, is my understanding. Well, but also uh, neuroscience is a branch of bio biology. Um, and so I think a lot of it comes because the neuroscientists were biologists. And so they were biologists who uh, took their biology and kind of asked a neuroscience question, right? Um, I don't think it's that the neuro neuroscientists as a group picked it up. I think it's the, the kind of derivation of... You know, we're derived from biologists, right? So th uh, this almost this almost gets back, though, to the earlier question, which I don't want to derail us, but I do kind of want to explore slightly more fully, is, like, what is the point of neuroscience? Especially, and I think this highlights it again. It's like, well, I mean, on some level, uh, many neuroscientists want to understand the human brain. Many want to understand a brain. The same way that when people are studying the effects of, of novel medical treatments on 
eventually humans, they first will run experiments on, you know, rodents, um, perhaps mice. Uh, the similarity, the, the analogies between uh, a rodent brain and a, and a human brain, based on the sense that they're both vertebrates, both mammals, you know, th there are many things that are similar. And rodents are capable of extremely complicated behavior. So whether you're interested in behavior, whether you're interested in uh, sort of structural elements of the brain, whether you're interested in, you know, the medical plausibility of something, uh, for all of those reasons, I mean, you can study a, a mouse kind of almost just as well as you can study a human. It really is when you talk to sort of the cognitive neuroscientists or, or cognitive scientists or psychologists that you, you know, the, the, the differences between rodents and and humans are more pronounced where people say, oh, I want to study planning or I want to study language or I want to study, you know, sort of symbolic reasoning or something like this. And in those spaces, like, obviously, uh, it's, it's, you know, I, I say obviously, I guess there are people who probably would disagree with that, but almost unambiguously, it's, it's much easier to study all of those things in humans. Yeah, I mean, there are people who even say that you can't really study vision in mice because their visual system is pretty poor and it's not what they really rely on, or so the assumption is. Um, but that kind of actually relates to, to what I was saying about maybe having inherited these models that were chosen for other questions, because, like, uh, in the in the start of the arts of article, he talks about how scientists used to like go outside and get their research specimens, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. and I think that there's some truth to that. Like they would just like capture, yeah, yeah, yeah lobsters and stuff um, is a common model organism, uh, and they really would just capture them from the wild. Uh, and so animals that we study now, not only are they specifically chosen for the research question, they're also not wild animals they're just lab-grown animals and they're animals that they're like without context and like i don't even know a lot about the ethology of mice like what they naturally do in the wild and kind of to reverse engineer like okay i have a mouse i'm forced to study a mouse what actually would be the question that i would want to answer that i would choose a mouse for like study the thing that they would be the model organism for if you were allowed to pick and focus on that because that's the thing that they're the most relevant organism for yeah i, I think there's there's that but i guess this to, to reflect or, or more explicitly state what I think part of the role of neuroscience is, I mean, yes, there are these grand questions about human cognition, and I think those are pretty core to much of what people in neuroscience are interested in. But slightly more broadly, um, rodents are capable of like a tremendous amount of behavior. They're just like, I mean, they're animals. And when you think about that, like relative to inanimate matter in the universe. <laughs> okay, fine. No, no, like they're Yeah, they're remarkable. better than stardust. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but, but like they're- Or they're... compared to Drosophila even. Yeah, I know. That's what I'm trying to get at. It's like rodents in, in, in my estimation, like are, are compared to like non-living things, compared to other living things are remarkably close to humans. But like, I don't, I don't, I'm but, saying, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit saying that maybe they're not good enough at stuff, but I'm more saying I don't know what they're good at, because we don't even really make it a, a point to study their normal behavior. I, I mean, there are people who study their normal behavior. Right? Well, they should talk to neuroscientists. <laughs> no, I, I, I think there are <laughs> neuroscientists, I, I think there are neuroscientists who are pretty well aware of what it is that, that animals do. Well, I'm um, not even sure that that's the right thing for lab mice, right? They've been in the lab for a long time. They're pretty inbred. And they're pretty... I mean, they behave fundamentally differently than uh, uh, wild-caught mice, and you wouldn't expect them to have the same ethology because they're not the same animals really anymore. Yeah, that's another issue. They're very genetically identical, and they're raised in sterile, boring environments that mm -hmm. kind of reduce the need for them to have a nervous system at all, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that, and, that part's clear, yeah. And, and getting back to your point about... Uh, uh, or whichever of your points about uh, uh, whether mice are even a good good model for uh, vision, people used to use cats and weasels a lot, right? Or ferrets, rather. Cats and ferrets. And those have kind of become less popular. But they were popular because uh, they're both predators, so they have forward-facing eyes like we do. Uh, they're both visual predators, so they use uh, vision heavily for their, uh, for their behaviors like we do. Um, and you might think that they'd be a better uh, better model for vision than than rodents. I don't actually know if that's true, but you know that's kind of the the, the broad claim. 
Uh, but again, we don't use them because they're large. They have much longer generation time, um, and and uh, we don't have the genetic tools for them. Uh, so they're kind of maybe even if we if we did still use them, we wouldn't get as much information out about them because or information about our nervous systems from them just because the tools are so good and the the uh, information would come so fast from from mice uh, that it's just better to use mice. I mean, I think that'd be the argument. Yeah, So, and, and let me double down on my point, which is that notwithstanding the fact that maybe mice are, like, in, in nature don't use vision super heavily, they still use vision. Right. And so I, I guess from my perspective, like, and, and, and this was more the emphasis that I was trying to place. It's like... They do stuff. They do stuff. And, <laughs> and like, if we could understand how mice use vision... The fact that there are other animals that are more reliant or, mm -hmm. or vision is more their dominant sensory modality, uh, like, it's not clear to me that the incremental difference in knowledge from, you know, like, how is vision used by a complex mammal, you know, like, whether we understand that in rodents or we use it, we understand that in a different animal, uh, it feels like most of the gain, like, it feels like it's a little misplaced to be concerned about the incremental gain in knowledge between uh, how how much rodents use vision versus how much, uh, you know. Uh, I well, I'll say that, you know, if you're interested, it depends where you're interested. So if you're interested in the, like the retinal ganglion cells, which are in the eye that, that uh, uh, provide the, the kind of bottleneck for information from the eye into the brain, uh, there's a very different class of them that are predominant in, in monkeys than are predominant in uh, in rodents. So rodents have this large uh, collection of different retinal ganglion cells because they have much coarser vision, whereas monkeys or primates have basically you know ninety seven percent of their uh, uh, at least in macaques ninety seven percent of their retinal ganglion cells are of a single type. So if you're trying to understand you know why our retinal ganglion cells or why the cells in our eye are functioning the way they were, you'd kind of have a misleading idea of... Uh, I mean, there's more than that. Of course, I mean, like, primates also have kinds of uh, eye movements, which are, you know, qualitatively distinct. That's a big difference. Right. From, all, I mean, so the, I, the responses of neurons in primary visual cortex are also very different between cats and rodents, and they're more similar in certain respects between cats and macaques, so primates. So, but I mean, we know all these things because people bothered to study the same thing in a bunch of different species. So it's great. relevant. Yeah. yeah. But no, but it matters like personally, the type of uh, vision research I'm interested in uh, involves attention. And I don't really think mice can do the type of attention that I'm interested in. So that's, that's difficult for me because they have the tools to answer the kind of anatomical questions that I want answered but they can't do the tasks that I'm interested in. So it's relevant. It's very relevant to the question. And that's why I don't think there is such a thing as kind of being interested in vision, period. And it, maybe it would help if people were more clear. Um, but I also, at the same time, I do kind of agree with the idea like, well, if you can train a mouse to do a task that involves looking at an image and giving some uh, output based on what that image is, like, if it can do it, it can do it, and it's doing it through its nervous system. And so you should be able to figure out how it's doing it. And the extent to which that extrapolates is a question for another time or another person, mm -hmm. maybe, but it should be able to do it. So in a way, what we're trying to do with neuroscience is just build a pipeline for understanding neural systems. Like, I'm just going to define the behavior that I see the animal do, and then, you know, through the accumulated knowledge of neuroscience, I should be able to dissect uh, pathway and figure out how it works because we've figured out how a bunch of different nervous systems has worked. That's like another way in which the research generalizes is not the specific findings, but the patterns of thought and the research methods. It's like when you write code, you want to be able to pass anything into the code and it should be able to handle it. You're like developing a good system for learning about nervous systems. Yeah, I agree with that. <laughs> um, but again, it's, you know, some people don't care about nervous systems is care about the human nervous system yeah uh, but i mean if we're going to understand the human right. nervous system we need to know how to understand nervous systems probably so we got to practice on animals i guess uh, that but that also assumes that someday we'll have like really good access to the human brain <laughs> that we can apply these things that we've practiced to the human brain yeah uh maybe we can talk about also so 
in terms of the extent to which specific findings generalize, I think it was in the paper about flies where there was, um, oh yeah, they said that it seems kind of based on cumulative past research that complex brains depend on an elaboration of existing themes rather than uh, cellular or molecular level innovation. So they're saying that we can probably study how neurons in flies work and those basic things will be the same in the human brain. They'll just kind of put the pieces together differently, but they're not developing anything new at the cellular level. Um, I don't know if you have thoughts on that in particular, Adam, having um, studied flies. No, well, I mean, this is certainly what we always tell ourselves in invertebrate research. Um, <laughs> I don't know if it's actually true or not, to be honest. Um, you know, I think the, the unsatisfying answer is always going to be, you know, sometimes it'll be true and sometimes it won't be. You know, there's sometimes things that you can do in bigger brains that you just fundamentally can't do in smaller brains. And uh, there are going to be things that are more efficient or you'll have different constraints uh, in smaller organisms you don't have in larger organisms. Uh, so uh, one, of these, one of these building blocks that uh, is really important in C. elegans is the use of peptides. So peptides are a, uh, a, uh, uh, something that's released from a, a neuron that's acts on another neuron in, in kind of a, uh, we'll say a non-classical way, it modulates it in some way. Um, and uh, in C. elegans, it seems like, you know, 99% of the behaviors are really all about peptides and not about kind of classical transmitters. I and mean, that's an exaggeration, but, you know, peptides are extremely, extremely, extremely important. And there's something that we basically ignore in... Peptides are proteins or... Uh, yeah. In in convention conventionally studied neuroscience system like you know neural systems there's uh there's a, a set of small molecules that are used to communicate between cells between neurons and there are also these kind of indirect larger molecules that might have kind of uh indirect effects on the the downstream neuron or something yeah like i don't know if they're larger molecules you know there's short short amino acid chains um but they have they're they're neuromodulators we'll say yeah, uh, I mean, so compared like to like acetylcholine or something, like yeah, it's not just from one neuron to another. It's like a diffuse signal that might affect the neuron differently than a straight up neurotransmitter. Yeah, so it might not change the uh, the firing rate, but it'll change how that neuron fundamentally responds to things. Uh, and they're kind of they're not only all over the place in C. elegans, but they're you know vitally involved. Um, so. Uh, and we kind of tend to ignore them in vertebrate research. Uh, and the question is, is that because C. elegans are really small, so it's easy to send out peptides? Or is it because we have the tools in C. elegans to really appreciate their use, and it's harder to do in mammals, and harder to understand in mammals, so we just don't appreciate it yet? Uh, and we don't know the answer to that. Is that like a fundamental building block that we just don't appreciate in mammals, or is it uh, just something that's you know specific to, to C. elegans and Drosophila? I mean, I certainly think that they're going to be vitally important to understanding behavior because they're really involved in kind of longer term modulation, which is what most behavior is. It's not just reactive. It's it's kind of long term. But we don't know. And there are also there are other ways in which the elegans have like their neurons behave differently than mammalian neurons because they don't really spike and they're mostly um, electrical junctions, not chemical. Right. Uh, I don't know if they're mostly electrical junctions, uh, but they don't spike. Right, okay. right. they sure. don't spike at least. Okay. Um, and and that's probably because of you know they neurons spike because of uh, generally because Long of distance. Uh, yeah distance and, and yeah, coding yeah, yeah. and they don't have that that problem. But it's interesting to me that the C. elegans has so many differences on this lower level, this kind of cellular molecular level. And then it's being put forth, especially in the, the paper that we read, as a model for systems neuroscience, meaning that it, like, you can kind of look above the cellular level and just think about how the different neurons interact. Uh, they're particularly focusing on kind of sensory motor transformations. How do the C. elegans respond to a sensory input? How do they change their motor output? And it's just kind of, it's interesting to me to to see this where we usually think the the thing that we're going to be able to extrapolate the most is the lower level stuff. And they're kind of claiming, no, like study it at a higher level and you'll get principles that will apply at the higher systems level to other animals. At least I think implicitly they're claiming that these things will will translate and extrapolate to other animals. I mean, I certainly, I, I believe that's true. 
Uh, but I don't think we have a principled reason to know that that's true. Um, other than, you know, if something works, why wouldn't it work in, in, in larger animals or, or work in kind of convolutions? But I guess one of the things that I was thinking about when reading that was what exactly would extrapolate? Like if we're studying a neuron, mm -hmm. the neuron in the fruit fly, it extrapolates or the claim is it would extrapolate to how a neuron in the human brain behaves. But when it's systems level, it's like, OK, well, we found that in the case of this paper, they kind of say, one of the themes that they talk about is this idea that uh, a sensory input will kind of modulate the statistics of the motor output. The motor output is stochastic, like the neuron or the worm will turn or not turn kind of randomly, and you can modulate the probability of certain turns. It's not very deterministic, but you can modulate the probability by changing the sensory input, like putting some sort of chemical sensation for the animal to pick up on. And so I guess my question is, what are we then saying will extrapolate? The same idea that, like, if you put a smell in the air, then I will change my probability of moving? Like, I don't, I don't know exactly how to extrapolate those findings when they're at the systems level. Yeah, I, I don't know about that particular case. Um, I would say, um, you know, things like lateral inhibition uh, uh, and kind of divisive normalization, which occurs kind of across the 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 scale of, of nervous systems okay um, so you're kind of talking about smaller level phenomena not this whole sensory input to motor output transformation but like a circuit might perform this computation that might be something yeah. that's general yeah when you get from but I'm, it would I'm be not sure this is kind the, of that's kind of like a meso scale computational yeah. statement like mm -hmm. at, i mean even even between you know, as as we already referenced, the barn owls versus some kind of of rodent, uh, right? There's there's a difference in the way they do interoral time delay, you know, computations. Um, so it, it it seems like even if if complex animals can be using very different comp computational implementations to solve seemingly similar problems, uh, then it's 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 not clear that the sort of uh, whole circuit level stuff will be uh, really generalizable from from invertebrates to, to vertebrates. Uh, right. So I mean, I case, think. Yeah. I, I was gonna say I think the I and mean, this is where, like I said, we don't have any like firm reason to, you know, theoretically believe or like any any firm reason to believe a priori that any given uh, uh, motif or or pattern should should be present across the nervous systems. Uh, but this is, you know, I'm sure you guys will love this. Uh, this is where you kind of need theory and to understand, like, why that that motif or that set of behaviors is the way it is in one nervous system to give you some kind of leverage to understand why it would be that way across many nervous systems um, and where that might fall apart. Like, maybe the barn owl uh, has a particular constraint, and that's why you have uh, uh, that kind of uh, interoral localization there. And maybe without that constraint, you'd have the same, you know, in the same theory, plus or minus that constraint, you have this other uh, behavior that you see in, in the gerbils that probably is more uh, more general. Yeah, and again, it, it goes back to your interests and objectives, because I think that there are people who would find it interesting that a certain computation shows up across species, across scales, like, oh, isn't it interesting that normalization happens or gain control is another one that comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Stuff like that. And we don't really, like, if someone asks you what you study, you can't really say normalization or, like, a particular computation. But it's totally feasible to me that certain scientists would just be interested in knowing the set of computations that occur across animals and kind of pondering why those are the ones that the nervous system has settled on as its building blocks. I could see people being interested in that. Um, but that's also... Uh, last point. That's why you need to study them to understand what those building blocks are. It can, yeah, exactly. You know, there's an infinite, infinite range of possible building blocks, uh, but it helps to kind of start narrowing those down. Yeah. Any other final thoughts? I'd been looking for uh, an excuse to bring up this observation I made that in one of the papers they say that there are eight million species on our planet, and in another one. In the Michael Yartsev one, they say there are 8 million, and in the Embo news piece, they say there are 1.5 million. So either one of them is, is <laughs> patently wrong, or there's a g giant amount of uncertainty in how many species exist on Earth. I think it's the latter. 
So I just I thought that was. Were curious. they written at different times? We are killing off a lot of species. No, no, no the no, Michael Yartsev one is more recent. Okay, fine. I, they're, they're both. <laughs> oh no, they're uh, both 2017. They're both 2017 okay. papers. So <laughs> I, I just thought that was interesting that it you know two papers published in 2017 got at least their their statistics different in terms of how many species they are. Yeah, it could I, I be think diff- it, different definitions of species too. Yeah. Well, sure. Yeah, no, no, or genomic or to- totally. Um, Yartsev has a reference. The other one doesn't have a reference, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, e- either way, I, I, I guess the the range of that variance, both greater than a million, doesn't really change the point of how many animals we should study, I suppose. No. And that we study about ten of them. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. It was a pleasure. Till next time. <laughs> Hey, if you're still listening to this, you must really like us. So how about you go to iTunes or Stitcher and rate the podcast, give us some feedback. You can also go to our website, unsupervisedthinkingpodcast.blogspot.com. You can comment on different episodes, or you could give us ideas for new topics you want to hear about. We would love to hear from you. Thanks.